Hey, Vlad here, devinsidey.com. Welcome to another video. If you're new here, you should probably know that this is mostly a Scala channel, but occasionally we cover all kinds of dev topics like this one. Now, the original plan for this video was to make it about Cersei, which is a very prominent JSON parsing library for Scala. However, I haven't even made a video about JSON on this channel, so I thought maybe it's time to do so. But then I realized that JSON is text, and it doesn't make sense to talk about text before we talk about character encoding. And in order to do that, we need to first talk about numeral systems like binary and hexadecimal, for example. So here's the plan. I already made a video about numeral systems like two years ago, so you might want to check it out. I also made a video about using literals in Scala where we would create integers while using the hexadecimal 0x notation. So you might want to check that out as well. Today we're going to learn about transferring data from one computer to another. On a conceptual level though, there will be no actual networking code. Then in the next video, we're going to talk about JSON, which is a data interchange format. Both of these videos are going to be very beginner friendly and almost unrelated to Scala, maybe a little bit to the JVM. And only in the video after that, we will finally be able to talk about Cersei. Let's get right to it. As in most of my videos, I'm using an Ubuntu 18.04 virtual machine and I'm using Windows as a host and Windows has a feature called virtual desktops which gives me shortcuts to switch between my systems. So now I'm in Windows and now I'm back into Ubuntu. Most of my videos are very hands-on so we're going to go ahead and create a project right away. So I'm going to use one of my Jitterate templates like this. I'm going to call it encoding playground calm dev inside you and package is going to be just dev inside you and i'm going to open it with visual studio code All right now if you're new here like this is a jitterate template jitterate is a um, tool that allows you to create templates and they will be just pulled from github and then you can create project based on them if you're new to scala also don't worry we're not going to write too much code today i will be mostly talking okay uh let's do not now let's open my build this is a template that i usually use for all of my projects however if i'm recording tutorials i'm disabling a couple of flex. We're not going to use any libraries today, so we can go ahead and import the blue build. Again, if you're not a Scala developer, don't worry about anything that is happening right now. This is a very simple application, basically just a hello world. We have our main method and we're going to start SPT, which is, you know, if you're not a Scala developer, this is a build tool like Maven, but it is interactive in the sense that you start it and then you sit in there all day and just run comments from there. All right, so it's finally loaded, so I can just continuously run it. All right, so again, if you're not familiar with SPT, I just did tilde run I have an LS for run called R. Uh, tilde means that it will uh, watch for file changes, right? So every time I change something here, for example, I remove hello, I just save the file and reruns at the bottom. All right. So uh, as I already mentioned today, we're going to play around with transferring data from one computer to another. But again, there will be no actual networking code. We're not even going to write something to files and read them back. We're just going to simulate everything. These days, computers are powerful enough to talk at the level of bytes instead of bits. So I prepared something for you to have a tiny recap. I'm going to paste it over here here it's going to be in the form of comments. All right, so one bit can represent only two numbers, zero or one. One byte is eight bits, therefore one byte can represent two to the power of eight numbers, which is 256, right? So from zero to 255. However, in Java or Scala, as in most languages, you also need negative numbers, and therefore these 256 numbers are divided into halves. So you have uh, 100, uh, negative 127 until negative zero, or the positive zero until 127. This was called the one complement system, so you have 128 uh, on each side. Later, it was changed to the complement two, where there was no need to the negative zero, and therefore we have one more number on the negative side. Okay, so the numbers in Java or Scala and in most programming language, uh, you know, for for one byte, they go from the negative 128 through the positive zero to 127, and therefore you still have 128 on each side. Let's play around with that a little bit. So we're gonna have a print line of nin, and it's going to be a byte dot min value to binary string right so min value is going to be negative 128 and we're going to do two binary string and we're going to do the same thing with max okay over here it's going to be max over here it's going to be max like this let's go and see that real quick all right let's do exactly the same we're, we're going to improve this a little bit let's do exactly the same thing for the decimal notation that's when i'm going to do two binary string we, we can just do two string or just leave it out completely like that and we're going to do the same thing to hex string okay like this and we're going to do over here two hex 
and maybe we get some help over here yes two hex string okay let's also have these guys in between like this and this one over here like that now we need to improve this a little bit okay so we're dealing uh, on the level of bytes but there are also shorts and there are also ints so this two binary string if we jump in there we will see that it will go to the integer and do the two binary string all right there's also octals but we don't care about that right now because of that you know uh four bytes uh, fit into an integer so uh we're not interested in all of these um uh, in all of these three bytes before that so what we can do is we can uh, ask Scala to take only the right eight characters, all right, like this. And now we're going to see that there is one zero missing over here. So uh, you know, just to just to uh, let it print out uh, beautifully, we're going to do this. All right. So uh, these are the min and max values. As you can see, the minimum value is just basically you know uh, the the first digit is basically used for um, for the for the sign. All right. Now over here, um, just just for fun, you know, we're just having fun here. I like to uh, record my videos in this like plain and you know discovering and uh, yeah, basically just just plain style. And I did it in the wrong place. Hold on, over there. All right, I like to have fun with code, okay? So we're going from negative 128 to the uh, positive 127, okay? And we need to do the same trick for uh, for the hex. As you can see, we need only the last two characters. So we can go over here and we can say, take right, take right two characters. All right, so now we have it, right? We have the binary notation, we have the decimal notation, we have the hexadecimal notation. These are all the possible numbers for bytes. Let's go back to talking. Now we have two computers that desire to communicate to each other. So they send bytes to each other, usually in form of arrays, but they have no idea what these bytes mean. So they somehow need to agree on the semantics of those bytes. This is what is commonly known as a protocol, which is, by the way, not a computer problem. This is a general communication problem. For example, if I'm speaking to you, we need to both agree on the concept of characters so that we can understand how words are built and so that we can understand how sentences are built. In fact, this words metaphor is used in computers as well. For instance, when a microprocessor reads the instructions, it needs to know how long a word is because it needs to read the instructions word by word and therefore it needs to know when a word begins and when a word ends. For instance, if you have heard about the 64-bit microprocessor architecture, this only means that the word is 64 bits long which is eight bytes so coming back to our problem one byte is like a character in the English language since we don't need to go all the way down to bits this is too primitive for computers nowadays so one byte is a character and therefore eight bytes is a word so there you have it 64 bit architecture or you could also call it the eight byte architecture now I keep saying two computers but this is just an example so let me give you another one for example let's say that we have a database how does a database store its information well, it stores it in files, but what's inside of those files? Well, bytes. What do these bytes mean? Well, it depends which database you're using. Every database has its own format or protocol or whatever word you want to use for it. Another example, an image that is stored in your phone. It's a file. Again, what's inside of this file? It's bytes. What do they represent? It depends on the format or the protocol. Is it a JPEG picture? Is it a PNG picture? And so on. Now let's talk about the elephant in the room. Humans created computers and humans program computers. How do they do it? Well, we create source files. And what is inside of those source files? Bytes. What do these bytes represent? Well, as always, same as every database has its own protocol, every image, every audio file, every video file, every text file has its own protocol, which is called a character encoding or a code page or a character set and so on. Now, there is a lot of information about character encodings out there. And since this is a crash course, I'm going to try to keep this history lesson as short as possible. After the electronic computer was created, the U.S. popularized the famous ASCII format, which stands for American Standard Code for Information Interchange. This was the time when computers were not fancy enough to talk at the level of bytes. They were barely keeping up with bits. This was the time when they were basically just created. And so the ASCII format specifies 128 characters instead of 256 and therefore only seven bits are enough you don't need the whole eight by the way this was around 1960s where telegraphs were still around and in fact ASCII is heavily based on them what's the valuable inside of these 128 ASCII characters for this let me read out a passage straight from Wikipedia for you 
95 of the encoded characters are printable. These include the digits 0 to 9, lowercase letters A to Z, uppercase letters A to Z, and punctuation symbols. In addition, the original ASCII specification included 33 non-printing control codes which originated with teletype machines. Most of these are now obsolete, although a few are still commonly used, such as the carriage return, line feed, and tap codes. Now we're going to continue with the history lesson in just a bit to see how the ASCII uh, encoding evolved, but as I already mentioned, I want this video to be a little bit more hands-on, so we're gonna go and play around with ASCII. To be fair, this is actually not ASCII anymore, we're gonna get to that, but the format that we use today is compatible with ASCII. So let me go and um, maybe remove that a little bit. Let's just comment this out like this. All right, so we're gonna go and we're gonna print out one single character, which is going to be the character zero, like this. We're also gonna print out the A, and we're also gonna print out the small A. All right, now let's go and duplicate this line like this, and let's also print out the same character but now let's convert it to integer and the way this works is that basically it will show you the ascii code and again technically this is not the ascii code but it's compatible so it will show you exactly the code that we need all right basically i can just copy these and put them over here and just put my cursor over here over here over here and i can just do to it. So as you can see, the code for zero is 48. These are the decimal uh, symbols. The code for, for the capital A is 65 and the small a is 97. You can do some arithmetic with these numbers. So let's duplicate this again. Let's do that. Uh, let me copy the original one, maybe like this. All right, let's bring it down like that. All right, so what you can do is let's uh, have parentheses over here. What did I just do? Yeah, whoops, what did I just do? Hold up, let me go mark this. Let's have uh, parentheses over here. Let's have parentheses over here. Let's have parentheses over here. Let me go and put my cursor over here, over here, and over here. So what I can do now is I can just add one, right? So even though this is a character, I can actually uh, add one integer to it, and then I can convert it back to a character like this. All right, so as you will see, zero plus one is going to be the one, a plus one is going to be the capital B, and the small a plus one is going to be the small b. All right, so what we can also do is basically show you what is happening behind the scenes. So we can go here, we can go do that, and I can go to this character, position my cursor over here, and I can do two int plus one. And let's not, not do two char over here. Let's do this over here, All right? So as you can see, like each of these numbers increased, right? So we had, we started with 48, then it was 49, 65 went to 66 and 97 went to 98. So the next thing that we're going to see is that all of these characters and numbers, they're arranged in uh, order, which makes uh, writing programs uh, very, uh, very easy. All right. So what we can do is we can do print line and we're going to take the character zero. We're going to create a range from zero to nine. And the only way that it's possible is that because the codes, the ASCII codes, or technically the codes that we're used today, that they're all arranged in order. Okay. So this is going to be a range and we're going to take this range and we're going to map this. So this is going to be the character and we're going to prepend a space to it. All right, so now we have a basically a list of characters and we can uh, make the string to them by separating them with commas like this. And I'm going to duplicate this line so that I can show you how they actually look in, as integers. Okay, so we can do two int over here and we should see all the numbers zero to nine over here. And these are the ASCII codes. So as you can see, it starts with 48 and goes to 57. Now let's do exactly the same thing for the characters like this so we can just go from a from a to z or a to z depending where you're from like this so these are all the letters and these are all the uh, codes so it goes from 65 to 90. we're going to do exactly the same thing for the small ones like this and we're going to do a a z z and because we want to uh, make them look very, very pretty, we're going to go over here and we're going to say if the character is small or equals to the character C, then we're going to do this. And otherwise, we're going to use two spaces, okay, like this plus, plus the character. All right. So there we have it. So A starts with 97 and Z ends with 122. Okay. So all of them are arranged in order. Let's also just for fun. Um, 
show some characters which are not just the you know not just the alpha and the mary characters for example uh this is the space character and we can see the int value of it uh, we can also see the backslash n which is the typical line break line feed uh character let's also do the ampersand um symbol so these are the codes the 32 is the space the 10 is the uh, line feed and the 33 is the the bang so let's continue with the history lesson after a while two things happened first of all computers were starting to be used everywhere not only in the us and the second thing is that they became powerful enough to talk at the level of bytes and not just the level of bits and so we had this one extra bit remember 128 characters only took seven bits but we had like this one bit uh to to fill and you know one extra digit in a binary system means twice as many characters right so all of a sudden we went to 256 and therefore we had 128 uh, spaces to be assigned to different characters unfortunately it took a while until this last digit was standardized and you know technically speaking ascii was never changed uh, instead other formats were created including the so-called extended ascii which basically means the ascii where this last bit is uh, filled so what happened was that every country or even uh, every institution like universities or or companies like IBM or Microsoft, they came out with their own encodings for this extra one bit. And once this whole byte was not enough to represent everything, even more encodings were created. The standard that is used today is called Unicode. And the cool thing about Unicode is that it technically doesn't have anything to do with computers, bits, or bytes. They just took all the languages in the world, all the math symbols, all the physics symbols, all the sign symbols, emojis, and everything. They just took all of them and assigned numbers to them. That's all. Nothing to do with bits, nothing to do with bytes. And if you wanted to write one of these characters down on a piece of paper, the format would go like this. You would simply start it with a capital letter U, then you would use the plus, then some numbers in the hexadecimal notation which correspond to this character. For example, uh, 1, 2, F, C, 8. I have no idea what this character is, but I know that it is part of the Unicode. And in most programming languages, instead of the U+, you would use backslash U, but it's not always going to work. There are caveats to this. For example, this particular number, or you know, the, this particular character that this number represents is, for example, too large for a character. But we're going to talk about this uh, in a bit. All right, now, how many characters are there? And by the way, characters are called code points. And, you know, for this specific example, they're called Unicode code points. All right, for this, we're going to go straight to Wikipedia. And I already have a bunch of tabs prepared for you. So this is the first one, uh, which is basically uh, the um, article about uh, the plain Unicode, the, about the thing called uh, basic multilingual planes. So the way Unicode is arranged is in, in planes. Think about them as just levels, right? So uh, this thing over here is one plane, and there are 16 of them. And this one is the most important one. This one is the call, called the BMP, or the basic multilingual plane. It's the plane zero, or basically the first one. Okay, and we can read it over here. It says it contains characters for almost all modern languages and a large number of symbols. A primary objective for the BNP is to support the unification of prior character sets as well as characters for writing. Most of the assigned code points in the BMP are used to encode Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. It's these ones. However, it's not all of them, right? So there are other planes that, you know, they have way too many characters, all right? Um, we can ignore this one. We're going to talk about this a bit later. In a couple of seconds, we're going to talk about, well, more like minutes. In a couple of minutes, we're going to talk about UTF-16. And UTF-16 has this thing called the surrogate pairs. And once we're going to talk about them, I'm going to come back here. I'm going to point out that they're all over here in this gray area, all right? But for now, we can pretty much ignore this. What we can do is we can... Um, uh, talk about this a little bit. So every uh, every square is uh, 256 code points. This is what this thing says, okay? And there are 256 of these squares. So it's 256 times 256, which is around 65,000 points. As you can see over here, it's 65,536, all right? Most of them are taken in this basic multilingual plane. However, most characters in the entire Unicode are actually not taken. All right, so we can scroll down and we can see that this is the next plane, right? So this is the plane one. It's called the Supplementary Multilingual Plane or SMP. And it contains historic scripts, blah, blah, blah. But most of the characters over here are the unallocated code points, right? So most of them are empty. Let's scroll down. We also have the supplementary ideographic plane. So most of these are for the Asian characters. So CJK stands for Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. All right. So if we keep scrolling down, we see that the planes 3 to 13 are completely unassigned. So most characters in Unicode are actually not assigned to anything. All right. 
Now there is also the plane 14, which is supplementary special purpose plane, which currently contains non-graphical characters, but again, most of them are empty. And there are also two planes 15 and 16, which are designed as private use planes and they contain blocks called supplementary private use area blah 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 among other things they contain uh, things like uh, glyphs that are used for uh, ligatures if you uh, remember my, my video about ligatures in fact I'm using fewer code for for Scala as you have seen so I'm having uh, ligatures over here right so if I'm having this this symbol for example right so technically this is the uh, you know the less symbol and the equal symbol but if they're uh, being done together they're being represented as one character and I'm not 100% sure about this but i believe that somewhere one of these is uh you know represents exactly this uh, mathematical character in there all right so i did some math and all of these spaces together all of these 16 planes are 2 to the power of 20 characters which is around a million and uh, as you have seen most of them are empty as of right now we're using like 150k or something all right and in the future if you really wanted to this would be extended right so uh no no standard is set in stone there you know everything in software is constantly evolving uh however unicode is good to go for a couple of millennia i think <laughs> All right, now, as I already mentioned, Unicode has nothing to do with bits, bytes, or computers. It's just a bunch of uh, uh, characters from all over the world and a bunch of numbers assigned to them. Now, the question is, how do we encode them into bytes or bits? Now, we have 2 to the power of 20, so we need at least 20 binary digits, and the next byte number would be four, right? So because 20, uh, it does not fit exactly into, into the binary, right? So the, one would be like 16, which would be like, which would be two bytes. Uh, the next one would be 24 bits, but that's three bytes and three bytes is weird. And the next one would be four bytes, which is 32. And so the first format that we're going to discuss is going to be called UTF-32, 32. 32 bits, which means two to the power of 20 characters are going to fit in and 32 bits are four bytes. By the way, UTF stands for the Unicode Transformation Format. However, as we will see, this format is actually very flexible and technically it could be used to encode something else as well. But typically U stands for Unicode, so UTF is typically used for Unicode. All right, so now we have Unicode and we have a UTF format called UTF32 to encode this into bytes. However, it has two major downsides. The first one is that it's simply too large because most of the text that we're going to encode is going to be the uh, English characters, right? And English characters, they used to need only seven bits. However, if you were to encode a simple, character, simple English character in UTF32, you would have 25 zeros and then only the last seven bits for the actual character. This is highly inefficient. And the second downside is that it is not compatible with ASCII because an ASCII processor, it will look at the first eight bits and what would it see in UTF-32? Well, it would see a bunch of zeros and it wouldn't know what they mean. By the way, there is also a third downside which we're going to talk about in a couple of minutes. For now, let's solve the problems that we have and these problems were solved by the two equivalent formats called UTF-16 and UTF-8. Let's talk about UTF-16 first, which is the format that is used on the JVM. So for both Java and Scala, it's very relevant. No matter what you do, every string, every character inside of the JVM is encoded with the UTF-16 format. Now, UTF-16 and 16 is two bytes, allows you to encode two to the power of 16 points. But as we have seen, Unicode has more. Unicode has two to the power of 20. And so UTF-16 allows you to encode the points which don't fit into the basic multilingual plane, as we have seen. In fact, let me scroll up let me scroll up to it right so this is the basic multilingual plane right so if it doesn't fit then utf-16 actually allows you to use another utf-16 character to encode a full unicode point uh unicode code point this is what is called uh, utf-16 uh so-called surrogate pairs and this is where they are we're going to talk about them um in, in just a couple of minutes all right and so utf-16 it can be smaller than utf-32 right so most of the characters you can encode only with two bytes right the 16 but for some of them like emojis for example you would still be back to utf-32 so for most things it's going to be smaller more efficient but sometimes it will fall back to the full length of 32 uh, bits. Now let's talk about these surrogate pairs because what you do is you don't just smash two numbers together. There's a teeny bit of math involved. We're not going to go into that because the math is first of all very simple and second of all you can almost always look up these symbols for yourself. All right. So if I go over here uh, this is the math that is happening behind the scenes. For example uh, this is what it says. Code points from other planes called supplementary planes are encoded as two 16-bit 
code units called a surrogate pair by the following scheme, right? So you take the uh, you take this number, it is subtracted from the code, uh, and then blah blah blah. You can you can read all this. Basically, three very simple steps, but you actually don't need to understand any of that. So for example, let me take a random UTF-16 character, which is not in the basic multilingual plane. I'm gonna go to this page over here. This is if you just Google Unicode and emoji, and also these links are going to be down in the description. You're going to find this page, which is all the emojis. Okay, so we're going to scroll down like this and we're going to take a random one. For example, over here, see, this is actually the Unicode character. So I'm going to copy that. It's U plus 1F602. I'm going to go to another page called fileformat.info over here. And I'm going to simply search for this character. All right. So now I have found this character. Uh, this is going to be the first one. It is called Face with Tears of Joy. It's exactly what I was saying over here face with tears of joy all right so as we as you can see this is the unicode character okay but if we scroll down a little bit you will see how to encode this in utf 16. so it will be the 0x da3d and then another one 0x de02 and if you scroll down a little bit more even over here you will see that for java it's basically exactly the same thing so it's backslash u and then these hexadecimal da3d and then de02 in fact we're going to copy this copy this like this, we don't need the quotes, we're just gonna copy this. All right, like this. And we're gonna go back to my code and we're gonna do, hmm, let me actually, let me actually comment all of this out. Like this and all of these ones, like this. And we don't need that one either. Uh, let's just remove all of that and all of that. And all of that there we go there's narrow somewhere oh it just it was red so i didn't see all right so what we can do now is we can go and uh start basically printing out a sentence right so for example we can say this is my favorite emoji and we can just paste it paste it like this all right and we can say do you like it all right so if i run this now you should actually see this emoji and by the way usually the way they're rendered doesn't you know doesn't fit really well so let's have another another um space over here like this all right so now it looks uh looks kind of nice and you can actually copy it right so if i copy the actual emoji uh we can clone this and i can actually put it put it over there maybe i won't need this extra space yeah i don't all right. So as you can see, you can also just have this emoji uh, straight into your uh, into your source code, and we will talk about this by the end of the video. So just so that you understand, like these are two actual characters, and the math that is involved, make sure that these characters will not collide with the other characters. You know, as we have seen in the basic multilingual plane over here, they have dedicated space over here. Uh, this is what it says: the high surrogate um, uh, pair is it goes from D8 to uh, to db right so it's d8 to db these four and the lower lower surrogate goes from dc to df over here right so basically uh we can for example take this out i'm gonna cut this out and i'm gonna call this uh high right this is just a character okay so because it's a character we need to surround it with uh with single quotes right so this is the um you know the leading character uh whoops uh, I wanted to do this, AKA leading. And we can also do low, right? So the high surrogate and the low surrogate is this one. Cut it out and uh, put it over here like this. Actually, let's leave them in there as well. So let's leave them over here and over here, right? So it's basically just two characters side by side and uh, the parser will know that they actually represent uh, one character. Let's do, let me clone this and let me change this to string interpolation so that it can access variables over here, right? So this one is going to be dollar high and this one is going to be dollar low, right? And it should represent exactly the same thing, right? However, if you do only one of them, it's not going to be some other valid character, right? As, we, as you have seen, they have dedicated spaces uh, in there, okay? So let's do a dollar low. All right, so none of them are, are, are going to work. Okay, and also if you swap them, it's also not going to work. Okay, the the math behind this prevents it from uh, from producing some other valid character. Okay, so uh, yeah, you also have a couple of methods in the Java Center library uh, to make sure that these are the um, surrogate pairs. So you can do this, and is low is low by using low over here, and you can also do is surrogate pair and you can give it the two of them high and low not height height 
high and low like this all right so as you can see all of this is true but again for most uh, UTF-16 characters, only one, uh, you know, one byte, one character is enough. For example, if we go and do print line, uh, hello, okay, we're going to map this to ints, to hex string, and we're just going to make a string out of it by having spaces between. Okay, so these are the, the characters that you, you would need to produce the hello. So what you can do is you can print out a string with these, right? So I can take all of these, I can copy, I can go over here and I can paste them and I'll just put my cursor over here, 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 and here. And what I can do is just backslash U zero zero. Okay. So it's basically these characters. So if you print out, print that out. Okay. Maybe we need uh, this and this and this and this and this. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. So these are the characters. Hello. Uh, you can also do the, uh, the regular notation. So let me, let me duplicate that. Uh, let me do a string interpolation over here and let me mark these, right? So instead of backslash U, we're going to just do zero X and therefore we don't need the zero zero. We can just do that. All right. So we just need to make sure that the interpolator, um, I ruined something, understands that these are going to be variables because what I need to do is I need to go over here and I need to do a two hex string like this. Let's see if I did it right. Uh, almost like this. All right. As you can see, it's the same characters. We don't need that many spaces. Hold up. Do, 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 do. Like this and like this and like that. Right. And you can do the same thing with uh, simply to char like this or to car to character. Okay. To character like this. But now we actually need the space again. Man like this. Let's see if I did it right. Yes, I did. Now, UTF-16 seems to be clearly better than UTF-32. However, it has one tiny problem. Remember, computers these days, they don't talk at the level of bits. They talk at the level of bytes. But even the character, even the code point that is in basic in the basic multilingual plane, like for example, the letter L, even though it doesn't need this surrogate pair, still every character, so every code point that is encoded in UTF-16 needs two bytes. And therefore, two computers that are talking to each other in UTF-16, they need to agree which of these two bytes comes first. This problem is known as the problem of the endians, right? So does the, does the big and come first or does the little and come first? It's called the big andian and the little andian. And by the way, UTF-32 also has exactly this problem, which is the problem that I mentioned a couple of mini, mi, minutes ago. I said that UTF-32 also has the third problem that I'm going to talk about in a couple of minutes, which I did. Now, we're going to see how this is handled in just a couple of minutes. I don't want to go into details, but essentially um, the UTF-16 uh, encoders and decoders, uh, they put some uh, special so-called byte order marks in the beginning, uh, but you know you can't rely on the parsers to actually, um, to actually check them out. And anyway, uh, so UTF-16 is clearly an improvement to UTF-32. However, it doesn't solve the second problem, the fact that UTF-16 is not compatible with ASCII, right? Because remember, an ASCII parser, it will look at the UTF-16 uh, encoded uh, code point, and it will see in the first uh, eight bits, it will see a bunch of zeros, and it will not know how to handle this, right? And therefore, we have the UTF-8, which is pretty much the standard these days, right? So the world runs on UTF-8, uh, um, like 95% of the web uh, runs on UTF-8. And we're going to talk about UTF-8 right now. So the way UTF-8 works is that for the characters that are ASCII characters, you can represent them exactly the same in this one byte. And we're going to see examples um, of this a bit later. And if further bytes are needed, then the highest bit or the two highest bits are, uh, are, are used to explain to the parser that the following byte st still belongs to the same code point. In fact, let's go to Wikipedia because they have an awesome uh, image for this over here. So this is how, how it works. It says, uh, since the restriction of the Unicode code space to 21 bit values in 2003, UDF-8 is defined to encode code code points in one, two, four bytes, right? So we can still go, uh, you know, in the worst case scenario, you can still go to, to 32 bits, uh, depending on the number of significant bits in the numerical value of the code point. The following table shows the structure of the encoding. Basically, uh, so this is the first level, right? So this is this this would be how, uh, you know, ASCII characters would be encoded. You would basically have a zero. Remember, ASCII only needs seven bits, right? So you have the zero, and then um, basically, if the parser knows that uh, it sees a byte with a zero, it knows that there is only one byte that it needs to look at because it knows that this one byte represents the entire character. However, 
if the parser uh, sees one one zero, then it knows that the second byte uh, also belong still belongs to the same character. Right? So basically, it knows that two bytes are needed to encode one character, and it will expect in the second byte to see a one zero. And the same thing is happening for the other layers, right? So the following all the follow up bytes they will always start with one zero. Okay, so for example, uh, if uh, you wanna uh, tell, uh, let the parser know that three byte, you know that the character that you're encoding uh, requires three bytes then it will start with one 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 zero right and it will know that it needs to look at this byte and also at this byte right it's a really wonderful format really wonderful idea so we have uh, unicode which is very solid and we have utf8 which is also very very solid uh two really beautiful um uh standards and in fact there are many things in in the software development that you kind of would think that they're standardized but they're not but this is a, a clear uh, exception right so both unicode and utf8 they're really really good cool so now we can go and play around with utf8 a little bit and for this we're going to actually um well first of all let me remove all of that stuff again so let's do whoops i don't like this thing about uh vs code that it jumps around like this all right so for this we're going to go and create another file uh we're going to call it protocol protocol dot scale okay so this one uh, is going to simulate a transfer from one computer to another okay so it's going to be just a final class final class we're going to call it protocol and if you're not familiar with scala these parentheses denote the constructor uh, so we're going to be able to send some string with encoding and the encoding is going to be a string right and we're going to receive with encoding encoding string like this now, again, if you're not familiar with Scala, this is the body of the class, okay? And inside of it, we're going to have a method which will simulate the transfer, okay? And we'll give it the string that we want to send, which is a string, produce a unit, and for now, let's just print out hello world, all right? Because I want to go and uh, go into the main and I want to uh, start using this, okay? So over here, we will say val protocol, 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 equals new protocol all right and we're going to say that we want to send this with encoding which is going to be utf32 all right and i'm going to duplicate that and it's going to be receive with encoding utf32 and we're going to play with others as well okay so um then we're going to print out console.green console dot a reset and actually it should be just print so the way this works is basically that uh, everything that i have uh, between over here print line blah 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 everything is going to be green all right and uh we're going to duplicate this and have that as well over here that's going to be yellow all right i'm just creating some uh some uh, scaffolding okay so uh what we're going to send over here is going to be hello hello world and by the way, I don't want to. I don't want to print line at this point. I want to say protocol dot. Uh, how did I call it? Uh, simulate transfer. Okay, simulate transfer. Uh, hello world. Right. But as of right now, remember our implementation just prints out hello world. So it doesn't matter what I'm, uh, what I'm passing over there. All right. Let's uh, duplicate this line, bring it down, and uh, I want to send hello world in Russian. All right. Over here, it's going to be hello world in. Russian. All right, great. So this is how we're going to use it. So now let's go and implement it. And remember, this is going to be just a simulation. It's not going to be an actual um, sending of something. All right. So we're going to have the braces over here, like this. Let's throw this out. Okay. So uh, first, uh, let's print out. I'm going to send. Okay. And it's going to print out string to send. All right. So as you can see, I'm going to send hello world, and the other one says I'm going to I'm going to send. Privet mir. This is in, in Russian, same thing, hello world. Okay. Now let's go and create the bytes that will be sent. Bytes to send. This is going to be an array of bytes. Okay. And the way we do this is basically we're taking our string to send and we can do a get bytes. All right. So this is a JVM level, uh, you know, it's, it's in the Java Center library. Okay. So uh, we're going to uh, convert this into bytes and we're going to convert them while using our one of our encodings. Right. So this one, send with encoding. All right. So uh, what this code is doing, it always, it always converts from UTF-16. Remember, all the strings, all the characters in Java are always in UTF-16, no matter what you do. Okay. To the encoding specified. All right. So this code takes a UTF-16 string, converts it into, in our case, it's UTF-32. Right. We specified UTF-32. All right. 
So now that it did that, let's uh, print out something. All right, we're gonna say, and these are the, uh, we're gonna do uh, bytes, bytes to send dot size. Okay, so I just wanna see how many how many bytes are going to be. Bytes dot size send with encoding bytes. All right, let's see that. All right, so it's gonna say, um, I'm gonna send hello hello world, and these are the, in this case, 48 UTF 32 bytes. All right, let's actually see the bytes. So we're gonna do a print line, uh, bytes to bytes to send map. This is going to be a byte. I'm just gonna make them uh, look pretty, okay? So I'm just gonna do a zero X to, to remind us that these are the hexadecimal characters. Uh, zero X B dot two hex string, all right? And over here, I'm just gonna do a make string, uh, separate them with commas. Okay, so this is what we have. So these are the 32, uh, 32 bytes, and as you can see, right? So um, these are these are four bytes, and as you can see, they're always like zero, 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 and then you actually have the ASCII H, right? Which is which is the uh, uh, forty-eight, but this is not the decimal forty-eight, right? So this is the hexadecimal forty-eight. And same as in Russian, you always need the thirty-two, uh, thirty-two bits, right? These are the, the the four bytes. We're gonna we're gonna play with other encodings once we once we finish the implementation. All right, so uh, now we're gonna pretend like uh, there's gonna be some wire, right? So we're gonna do a uh, printout. And uh, by the way, the, the character that I'm using uh, for this for this hyphen is actually a Unicode character, backslash U2500, okay? And I can just have it, I don't know, a couple of times, like 12. I'm gonna duplicate this and I'm gonna say, uh, let's pretend uh, that this is going to be the wire, right? So I'm gonna do, uh, this is fear code, which is why it looks so cool. So I'm gonna do wire, okay, like this. Right, so after after every print is going to do wire, and by the way, I can just uh, copy this character, okay, copy and put it over here, and it's going to be exactly the same, right? So this is exactly the same character. Okay, we're gonna talk about this uh, uh, in a bit, actually. All right, so let's continue writing this. So we're gonna say print out, and we're gonna pretend like this is a, a different computer. Okay, so it's gonna say uh, I received bytes bytes to send. Uh, in fact, uh, you know what we're going to do? Just for readability, we're going to do uh, bytes bytes received, right? Which is going to be an array of bytes, right? In this case, in this case, it's just going to be bytes to send, right? Because this is a simulation. We didn't actually send anything anywhere, right? So we're going to do uh, bytes received dot size. So I'm gonna, it's going to say, I received these many bytes and I have no idea what they mean, but Right. So as a reminder, right. So nothing in these formats, nothing in Unicode, nothing in UTF-8, uh, will explain to the receiver that this information actually is UTF-8. Right. So this is what I meant in the beginning of the video. These two computers uh, need, or, or you know, the program that reads stuff from your database, or the program that reads your image, uh, they need to agree before this whole process on which encoding is going to be used. All right. All right. So uh, we're going to print out uh, bytes received. Bytes received. Well, actually, I can just do that thing. All right. So it's going to be that. Whoops. All right. So it's just going to be bytes received like this. All right. And that will say, okay, uh, I will try to decode them with, and remember, we have this variable at the top, receive was encoding. All right. So in in uh, this example, we're going to try to decode it with UTF-32, right? Which is going to work, right? Because this is exactly the format that it was um, sent with. All right. So uh, now we're going to, uh, you know, the decoding from bytes to strings is working like this. So uh, usually, usually. Uh, you would use uh, literals to create strings, right? But you can actually, you know, string is a class, so you can actually use the constructor new string, and you can give it the bytes bytes that we receive, and you can specify the encoding, right? So it's basically the the mirror uh, to to this one, right? So in from a string to bytes, you do get bytes, you specify the encoding, and from bytes to string, you just do a new string uh, bytes received, and you use the encoding over here, okay? And so we're gonna say a print line, I received, okay, and we're gonna print line print out string receive, okay? And now our simulation is is complete, okay? So in this case, it's kind of boring because we're using exactly the same encoding and this encoding is actually big enough to also uh, contain the uh, Kyrillic char uh, characters, okay? Kyrillic or Cyrillic? Kyrillic, I think it's Kyrillic. All right, so um, 
yeah so this is the the, the yellow one is the uh, is the Russian one the green one is the hello world so as you can see you know we sent the same bytes the same, same, the same bytes were, were received right so it, it decoded them with UTF-32 and therefore it received the hello world and it worked for for both of them all right so now we can go go and we can uh, uh, play around with um, with UTF-16. One thing before we do this, realize that we used, you know, 48 bytes, all right? So let's go to UTF-16, which should be smaller, right? So both ends are now UTF-16, and uh, now we see that only 26 bytes were used for the for the English characters, okay? And um, also 26 bytes were used for the for the Russian one, and and, and both of them worked. And by the way, notice these, uh, these two characters that look kind of different from all the others. And these are the, these are these ambient uh, byte order marks. Okay, so notice that you know they're being printed out as you know with four bytes. So basically, this is the FE, and this is the FF. Okay, and if we go back to Wikipedia, I actually have it open for you. And these are exactly these uh, these two characters. Where are they? Over here. All right. So both for English and for Russian, uh, we used 26 bytes. It was less than 32. However, we can do even less for UTF-8, at least for the English characters. Okay, so let's go for UTF-8. UTF-8, all right, and as you can see for English, we use only 12 bytes, all right, and for Russian, we use 21 bytes, right, so it's 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 still, you know, less than UTF-16, by the way, it's not always like this, like most of the time, uh, UTF-8 uh, UTF will use less uh, space than UTF-16, but sometimes on a very rare occasion, UTF-16 will actually use less bytes than, than UTF-8, okay, but these, this is all only for very special characters, so for the majority of cases, you know, use uh, UTF-8. But just a reminder, like all of the UTF-8, uh, 32 UTF-16 and UTF-8, they are capable of encoding the entire Unicode, okay? However, ASCII is not, so if we go to ASCII, uh, notice that the Russian word, okay? So if we do ASCII, and you, uh, remember uh, UTF is uh, completely uh, compatible with, with ASCII, as you can see, the hello world uh, in Russian is not going to be decoded properly, okay? So in English, it's not a problem, hello world, uh, and, and the hello world came back. However, for, uh, for Russian, you know, even though we sent the pro proper thing, uh, we, we still cannot decode them because there is basically there's just no character um, in there to represent this. In fact, the, the parser, um, you know, in, in, in Java at least, when it uh, recognizes that it is about to parse a character that does not fit into ASCII, it simply replaces it with a question mark, right? So it, it was capable to do this and to do this and also to do the, to do the space, right? But the other characters it was not uh, not capable to do. And remember, this is uh, completely compatible, right? So if we encode this with UTF-8, UTF-8, okay, and we decode it with ASCII, the English one is still going to work, right? It's compatible. Hello world, hello world. Now, the Russian the Russian one is still not going to work, right? So now it's even, you know, even other characters. But again, you know, the comma worked, the space worked, and the, um, the ampersand, it's called the ampersand, right? Yeah, I think it's called the ampersand, the bank sign. Unfortunately, in the real world, uh, what usually happens is, is that it happens the other way around, right? So somebody uh, encoded it with, with ASCII and, you know, you're trying to save the situation by, uh, by um, you know, decoding it with, with UTF-8, but it's just not going to work, right? So the English characters are going to be fine, uh, but nothing is going to help with this one, right? Because it's just, you know, it was, it was, the information was already destroyed uh, when it was encoded and, you know, a lot of developers, uh, you know, who you know didn't take the time to um, um, uh, to to play with this, uh, you know, they're you know they're like in, they're still hoping to to save the situation somehow by you know by using the proper format because they know you know UTF-8 is the proper format. But once information was lost, there's nothing that you can do. In fact, what's happening most of the time is that the uh, you know the typical uh, Western encoding uh, Windows 1252 is going to be used, but the result is going to be the same, right? So for English, it's going to work. We we'll see Hello World here, Hello World over here, uh, but for Russian it's not going to work, right? You see the question marks. The moral of the story is that Unicode is an amazing design, UTF-8 as well, so always use UTF-8. The world runs on Unicode and UTF-8. Now, before I leave, I would like to confuse you a little bit more. Our source code itself is text, right? So ultimately it's bytes. So what kind of encoding is the Scala compiler going to use to uh, to decode the characters that I'm that I'm putting over here, right? So these are the Unicode characters. For this first, we need to consult my editor, which is the Visual Studio Code. So every time I press Control S, right? So every time I'm saving the file, 
it needs to know which encoding to use to save this file and this encoding you can see over here it says UTF-8 you can actually click click over here and you can reopen this file with a different encoding or you can sell, save it with a different encoding but UTF-8 is actually exactly what I want over here the next thing that we need to know is how will the compiler read this out and uh, both the Scala compiler and SBT they're you know they're written in Scala therefore they're basically JVM programs and therefore we can consult the file encoding property right so this is a JVM uh, system property we can do system dot get uh, property property and we can do uh, file dot encoding and we should see UTF-8 because again UTF-8 is is the standard okay you can also do uh, we can actually kill this and we can do um, spt hyphen hyphen v okay and we're going to see that this is also the encoding that that it is using all right uh, let's go inside again now this is sort of unrelated but you can actually uh, see you know remember that we use the Unicode characters inside of strings but you can actually you know again this is a bit unrelated right so it's unrelated to UTF-8 but actually we could use these characters to write the code itself right so not inside of strings but actually to write the code itself so for example uh you know again we're, we're just having fun over here right so let's start running this all right so we can go and do uh let's print out just the character n right not, not the backslash n just the character n uh two int two hex hex string okay let's do the same with the open paren and with the closing paren like this all right so uh, now we're going to see the the hacks representations of of these characters okay so it's 6e 28 and 29 so what we can do is let me let me um, copy this line uh let's do uh let's do hello world over here hello world or something okay so we can go to this n character and instead of typing n we're going to do backslash u okay we're going to do zero zero and we're going to take 6e right 6e is this one okay as you can see it compiles okay so the same thing for the paren we know it's 228 so we can do backslash u 0028 and we can also go over here and we can do backslash u 0029 all right so the problem is that once i save this uh, i have a formatter that will ruin this so as you can see it just it just ruined all of them and it's actually a bug in the formatter uh, so there is a way to disable it usually you would do a format off uh format on however for these very special characters it's actually not not kicking in all right so uh what i need to do is i need to save this file uh without formatting like this and as you can see this is a valid program and it prints out hello world and you can do these sort of tricks uh, everywhere uh, did you know for example that you can actually use emojis inside of your urls you probably shouldn't for you know seo reasons and also for not making people crazy but it's kind of cool to know that you can actually use unicode characters like emojis in your urls before i leave i would like to confuse you a little bit more and i want to give you an example of a similar relationship that unicode has with utf-8 and this relationship is much much lower in the osi stack it is a relationship basically between the digital you know between the binary signals and between the analog signals signals you know the reason why we're using binary in, in computers is that so that we uh, we can be sure that the signal is there or not however believe it or not um, a you know a signal that is uh, I don't know uh, above uh, 10 volts um, is sh should be the one and the signal that is uh, I don't know below 5 volts for example is a zero this is actually not how the digital zeros and ones are encoded in a signal because uh, even though sure there aren't that many things that can make 10 volts look like five there are actually a lot of really powerful things out there like I don't know like a tractor or you know some construction some big magnetic field uh, something that 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 actually will manage to make 10 volts look like 5 volts all right and for this uh you know more um how do you say more, more more battle proof encodings are actually used to convert zeros and ones into analog signals for example uh let's say that we wanted to encode the one uh, not as just 10 volts but as two uh 10 volts spikes right and the same thing for the zero not just one uh five volt spike but uh, two five volt spikes okay what this will allow us to do is will it will allow us to uh detect an error right so as soon as our you know as soon as a network card will see that there is a you know that there's 10 volts followed by five volts it will know that there was some some error it will it will not be able to fix the error but at least it would be able to um to to detect the error right now in re now this was just a random example in reality much more uh bulletproof um, um encodings are used right but this is just a you know just to give you an example of this you know uh 
of this relationship between UT, UT, uh, Unicode and UTF-8, and also this relationship between the, um, the digital uh, bits and the, the analog signals. All right, I think I confused you enough. Let me actually open my terminal to do something fun. I'm not sure if I have C-Matrix installed. I don't, hold on. Install hyphen Y, C-Matrix. Right, because we're talking about about characters and about the encodings and about all of that stuff. So let's install C matrix real quick and run it just for fun. C matrix, there we go. Yes. All right, I hope you enjoyed this video. As always, it's been Vlad, devinsideyou.com. Don't forget to like this video if you did. Subscribe if you want to improve the developer inside you. And if you learned something today, consider supporting me on Patreon and watch my videos before everyone else. And most importantly, take care.